Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to FMA Discussion. This is episode 349, and today we have Guru Mike Cardenas on, and he's going to be explaining his system he does, which we haven't fully covered um, as of yet. So this is going to be that's going to be quite nice. In addition, he is going to be doing demos. So I'm looking forward to this. Uh, any system that hasn't got covered yet um, excites me. So if you are watching, tell us where you're watching from. Smash that like button, and we're just going to get started now. Hey there, how are you? Doing good. How you doing, Dean? Good, thanks. You know, again, thank you for coming on. You know, I appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, you heard the intro. So before we dive into the FMA aspect and that, um, what was pre-FMA training? Would you, like most of us, were you doing the kind of the uh, traditional martial arts? Yeah, I think like most of us, maybe you grew up watching the Sunday Kung Fu or Saturday Kung Fu, and you're like, I want to know how to fly on rooftops and, you know, throw my Fu Manchu behind me and and watch, you know, the Bruce Lee movies and want to kick, you know, people's asses. And so my actually martial arts journey started when I took um, Wulong Vietnam Kung Fu, the Shaolin Kung Fu system. Um, and honestly, when I... I I think I took it when I was probably around 15 when I started 14, 15, mm -hmm. took it for probably no more than a year and a half or something. And mostly it was just, I wanted the uniform. I wanted, <laughs> I wanted, I wanted to be the Kung Fu guy, but I didn't want to put yeah. in the work. You know, it was okay. a weird state where, and then it was in that weird period too, where all of a sudden it's like, Oh girl, Oh, female over there, you know? So my attention yeah. was all over the place and oh you're distracted i was distracted <laughs> quite a bit and then we had a pool table in the in the dojo so i would go and we train and then i just want to play pool all the time you know with my buddies and but yeah. um that's kind of where I, I started my martial arts training was through Wulong vietnam kung fu and it was taught out of a confucius center in stockton uh by a crosstown freeway so for most people who are stockton uh by me ranchito the little restaurant there there's a um, by the underpass, there's a Confucius Center, and we train right over there. Okay. So, so you know, with regards to Stockton, is it is there still a big Filipino community there? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That's what's interesting is even though how big a community it was when I got into the FMAs, I didn't know anything about it. You know, mm. I had no idea that they there was an even a martial arts. You know, I know. I, I hear schools. that a lot, especially from. The folks uh, in the Philippines, you know, when there was a time when basketball and um, Taekwondo were just in popularity, you know, exceeded FMA and many of these young people coming up don't even know what their own art is. I mean, I, I just found that kind of sad, you know. Yeah, right. It's crazy. <laughs> yeah. To think, to think that I'm now involved in a martial art that's it's in my DNA, you know, it's in my life fabric of what I do. Mm. You know, I was born and raised in one of the epicenters of. I was going to say Stockton. I yeah, mean, right? you know, out on the East Coast, that's like, you know, yeah. we were all like, man, that's that's the place. I mean, that was the place. Yeah, you know, yeah, just, yeah, absolutely. Know. So that was my early start. Was 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 with that. And what? Um, okay, so what? Um, what got you in FMA? What was the transition? I guess who who went where and what style? Okay, so from from that, I took a break of martial arts training. Uh, I worked at a place, a suspension part company. It was named uh, Rare Parts Incorporated, and they make, at the time, they made suspension parts for vehicles from 1930s to the current year. So here's my marketing plug for Rare Parts. Uh, but I worked in the machine shop, and I was also um, was studying, get my electrician journey, uh, going through an apprenticeship program for to be an electrician. Well, while okay. I was working there doing that, hooking up machines and clean up and doing some machining, uh, a guy by the name of George Magana worked in the shipping receiving department. And he was already started studying under the Guardas, under the late uh, Grandmaster Arthur Gonzalez. And okay. so we became really close friends. And he was like, you, hey, you want to learn some Eskrima fool? And I was like, what? <laughs> you know? Emphasis on fool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> You know, that's his, that's his uh, term of admiration. And so I said, yeah, what do you got? So we started doing some stuff and 
you know, I remember like an arm bar and he's like, okay, do your arm bar. <clears throat> and then he pulled my hand over me and he did like a sombrado on me. And, you know, I go, what was that? You know, that was the kind of first time when I was introduced to counters, mm. you know, and I was just thinking, here's the technique. The technique's going to work on anyone you put it against. And you know, that's how naive mm. I was early in my martial art training. And he goes, oh, no, you can counter here and this is how you can react, you know. And I was like, what's the mm. name of that technique? And I, he's like, I don't, I don't have a name for it. You just, just do it. <laughs> just, know, yeah. That was another thing that, that was new to me is, you know, a lot of the things I learned was it was a technique and here's the name applied to the technique. It wasn't really mm. conceptual form and based on principles and concepts, you know. So, so how old were you at the time? I was probably, that was in the mid, let me, that might've been early, like 92, 93. So I was probably in my 1920s, somewhere there. Mm. Somewhere in there is when okay. I kind of, when I just started out training with, and 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 you know we train in the shipping receiving area. We'd go into some of the areas into the into the little hallways and you know train there and and we'd always we'd always make time to train you know when we could. Uh, he'd just show me one or two things and then I just started. I, he goes, "You need to come train. You need to come train with come train with Art." You know, and at the time, GM wow, Art. You're, yeah, it's funny. So you get introduced like right in the factory <laughs> yeah i'm getting introduced to it yeah and so gm art he was brought out to teach publicly by uh daniel sizon who's now grandmaster daniel daniel sizon in which gm art left the system to him as the inheritor of, of the system and so okay. if it wasn't for his efforts gm art would never probably have started teaching publicly he was more of a recluse you know he was wow. one of, he was one of master graduates under gilbert Thiniel. But I think he saw it as opportunity. Well, if this guy wants me to teach and train, I can continue my study and I need some bodies to train yeah. on. So that early phase was, we were just like meat puppets for GM art, I think, you know. <laughs> Experimental objects. Yeah. But at the same time, you know, I really knew no different. You know, we yeah. kept them all beat up and bruised and, you know. We, yeah, and you're young too, so. Yeah, you're, 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 yeah, you're younger and so it's not, <laughs> You know, it's not a big deal. I show up a few minutes late to work or whatever. It's, you know. Wow. And, and, but anyway, so, yeah. At the time, did he tell you what the actual system was? He just said it was de Cuerlos, but to me that meant, I mean. Yeah, I was going to say at your age, you're like, okay. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't even know. I just, I just knew that it was a weird period where I knew I had a deficiency in defense. You know, you're becoming a man. You know, you're already kind of in that man boy state. But I yeah. knew I had no real like man qualities that like how to defend yeah. myself. And then if I did get a girlfriend, you know, how could I protect her and her honor and my, you know, I would just, I felt, I don't know, just not manly at all. And, but I knew that there was, there was something missing. And to me, it was that ability to at least have some idea of what to do if someone choked me or someone threw a punch, you know? And uh, yeah. it just so happened that George was my senior, senior master, George Magano happened to be there right at the right time when I was going through this, you know, this mental next transition into man. And he had the edge <laughs> for me and, and, and I knew he could, he was a fighter, you know, and mm. he's one of those guys that like he smiles, you know, and he smiles if he were to get in a confrontation, he's comfortable with it. You know, it's a, it's a different mindset of someone who's like, Oh, I get to test what I'm doing here. You know, yeah. so uh, He's 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 had an interesting life, and he got to test a lot of the stuff we do. And he owned a bar named Primetime on the south side of Stockton, and you know he was always breaking up fights or taking guns mm. and knives away from people. And so uh, he legitimately legitimately you know used the the stuff. And so he would come back to me. He's like, okay, you know we did this, and I don't think that's going to work because this is what happened to me. Some fool came out at me, and blah blah blah. And you know mm. so we'd work on it and drill it and. Um, that's really how I found out about it. And then he took me to CGM Mart. There, he was teaching at a park and rec center named Stribley Park in Stockton. And I saw his training methods, and I kind of spooked me a little bit. I was like, oh, I don't want to get the shit kicked out of me here. I, this is not really. For I'm me. not ready for manhood yet. Yeah, I'm not ready for manhood yet. Maybe just keep, <laughs> give me some basics in, in, you know, at the company, you know, in the aisles there. And but eventually, I ended up, you know, learning so myself. I guess for uh, for folks who might not know, could you just tell us as far as the system, like who basically was the founder, so to speak, and created it? 
Okay, so we have Thenios de Cuerda. So in Stockton, you know, you have, which I consider three primary pillars. You had Leo Huron, you know, yeah. which is the Bahama style, you know, and the multi-style and OGE, mm -hmm. you know, that group. And you have Andrew Cabalas, which everyone pretty well knows is, you know, Serrata. And then yeah. you had Gilbert Thenio, you know, Grandmaster mm -hmm. Gilbert Thenio of Thenios de Cuerda. Now, Gilbert, okay. what's interesting about Gilbert Thenio is he also had Juan Ilia. So those two gentlemen, it was even though it was Daniel's de Cuerda, Juan Iliop had studied Serrata, Serrata. And so we have some elements of Serrata in our system because of Iliop, but I call our Serrata spaghetti Serrata. It's not, you know, we're not true sp practitioners like the Serrata guys who okay. own the skill in that, but we do, you know, some of the drills you might see are similar to Serrata drills and things like that, but it comes from the influence of, of Juan Iliop but so Gilbert Thino and I, from what I hear, all three of them at one time were sharing with one another, you know, mm. they're all like teaching under one roof at one time. Um, but I guess when you have that many alphas together, you know, it, it probably isn't that conducive. Eventually there's a split, but, uh, you know, unfortunately I think Gilbert Thino was probably the most reclusive, you know, he was out of all of them, you know, where he didn't I was gonna say that. because well, you heard of this system, and no reason how, matter of fact, dirt via the show here was that it was a piece in the multi Stockton. Without knowing that, I don't know if I would ever even heard of the system. So I was just curious as far as the quote unquote founder, what have you. But it sounds like they all, like you just mentioned, trained together because multi Stockton wouldn't be if they had not trained together, I'm guessing, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, um, so they had that influence that way. And then you had um, like Dental Revlar who studied the different systems, you know, so he's a big mm -hmm. name out there. And and even Daniel Sizon, you know, trained under Leo Horon. He trained under Angel Cabalas. And so he he was already training under those guys. And he was wanting to seek out, because he started hearing about, what's this Discordless thing, you know, as a yeah. student of Leo's and as a student of, of Angel, he still wanted to seek out this guy, GM Art, who had trained with Daniel. And um, so the even so that's someone who's kind of in the thick of it, training with Angel, who trained with Leo, and then mm. still, you know, there's this reclusiveness of the art. And, and for yeah. me, you know, choosing one or the other, I just, the Guerlos was just handed on my lap. And so that's just the path I took, you know. Yeah, right. I mean, you know, you're working with a guy. I mean, and, I mean, yeah, makes sense. So, um, so besides going to the back room in the factory yeah. when did you actually make the transition to be like more frequency as far as a student and what have you going to i guess it sounds like right. the park and rec no, yeah so start at the parks and rec i eventually started going there for a few classes but they were also transitioning then after that um terry joven who you know you know most actually he just said hi okay yeah right here yeah my buddy terry yeah he uh he took over the Rumbukai Karate School there behind the Long John Silvers on um, Pacific Avenue. And so that's where GM Art actually started teaching publicly was at a Terry school. Um, so we would meet up there and train. Um, that's kind of where I officially really got involved training as many hours as for as long as I could, you know, three to four times a week and then going to GM Art's ranch and training. Oh, with wow. This is pre kids and this is also yeah yeah before, before real life. responsibility yeah. before before real manhood came into play before real manhood came to yeah came to fruition you know <laughs> yeah. I was eat, I was eating it up you know? so yeah. that's kind of where it started though I think the officially my training started back in in that time you know okay at a Terry's school there where I really was mentally and uh, um I guess into committed to the to the to the art nice nice and uh, so were you also learning under terry as well or are you just doing the day cordis no just doing the decor at the time yeah just okay. doing, okay. yeah right. yeah so that's so, that's where it started not nice so just okay so to, for the folks who don't know including myself uh I, I i know very little about this system um can you just tell us i guess you know what the system is what it stresses and i mean does it stress a particular weapon or does it cover all weapons well it's it's kind of a well well-rounded well-rounded um art in my case and um so we do empty hands 
Uh, we do stick, single stick. We do a spada daga. We do rope. We have gun disarms, gun retention, uh, mm -hmm. knife. Obviously, we have some dumog. We have some buno, some stand up kind of entry entanglements, okay. uh, stuff like that. Um, there is some helot to it, the healing art aspect of oh, it. Really? All right. Okay. I didn't get, you know, it just there's so much to learn that I didn't. And at the time, I didn't really care about that. And actually, the yeah, healing, I know when you're young, you're like, I don't need that. Yeah, but eventually, <laughs> GMR wanted all his black belts to learn um, a particular healing art. So he yeah. he really pushed us into learn um, Sifu Jiu-Jitsu, you know, which is mm -hmm. under Danzenru, you know, under the Danzenru system, as, under Professor Okazaki healing art. And okay. so a lot of us who, at during that time, you know, we would participate in healing art seminars and get heat training and healing art of seafood jiu-jitsu because that you know another thing interesting about gilbertino he hung out along with a lot of the jiu-jitsu america folks the wally jays and and those mm. so uh one of his really good friends was you know chow hoon um and also wally J. you know okay so i think i'm sure there was a lot of influences from that as yeah well. um yeah, definitely. With all that cross training, I'm sure some of it bled through, right, or incorporated yeah. into it, and what have you. Yeah, yeah. We got, and we got some folks saying, "Yeah, we got, of course, Guru Terry. We got uh, Coach Danny, Ron. Oh, Jim Ron Saturno. We got uh, Maestro Carlito, Eric O'Brien, and we got Tom from Maryland. That's a funny guy, Tom. Um, but um, so okay, yeah. I mean, it sounds like you've got uh, definitely. I mean, you're covering. I didn't know it was that well run, to be honest, which is interesting. I mean, everything from basically edge weapons, long and short, blunt weapons, yeah. and flexible. Wow. So, I mean, when you, when you're saying the rope or the whip? Yeah, it's just rope. Yeah, we have rope. Um, and then I, I might show something with rope. And then we also do some canes techniques, which I didn't bring any canes with me, some staff techniques. But I just, you know, with the amount of time, I'm just going to showcase just a little bit to give you a flavor. Yeah. But it really, for me, rope is one of the best things man i think rope is just like you can carry it you don't have to worry about right. it's easily concealable i mean you i think rope is so devalued undervalued I, I just well and yeah and you think about it like a belt too you, you know we practice yeah. off of leather belts and doing entanglements and chokes with the belts and you know gmr one thing he was he was always pushing that envelope because the guardas the way he and and senior master george explained to me it's a vehicle once you learn mm -hmm. these concepts and principles, it's a vehicle to just become a better martial artist. And so he said, when you open up your Dequerlas book, when you get your, you know, your guruship or your master certification, you wow. know, you're going to take your, your, take your notebook or whatever, you open it up. It's going to be a mirror. It's going to be you because it's going to be your mm -hmm. own influences and what you gravitate to and what you know. And um, I think that's the beauty of Dequerlas is it even now, as I studied Koshiru Kempo or studied, um, Kaju Kempo are now my just dipping my toe into BJJ, you know, having that influences of seeing things and seeing patterns and rec recognizing angles and positions. I wouldn't mm -hmm. have had that if it wasn't for the base of the Dequerlas that GM Art gave me, you know. So, uh, and uh, and speaking on him, is he I'm, I'm assuming he passed or yeah, he, pa he passed away in October 3rd, 2019 is when he passed mm. away you know so Jeez. not too long ago and he and he was just uh he was just getting started you know it's hard to say but he was he was really you know and the way he taught too i mean so you see my whiteboard i mean this yeah. is kind of this is like the way he taught everything you know you know we talk about mono negra and the chi and flow and footwork and how that ties oh, wow. bikes and i mean our our stick boxing, which I'm going to show some of it today. Some of our this okay. is all this is all GM Arts, you know, stick figure notes, and actually, you know, goes into some. We even go into some grappling stuff. You know, this is mm. this is just early early on. You know, so he gave me like little booklets like this, and that's how actually I came up with the curriculum for my school here. So I took all my old notes from my notebooks, and you know, and said, yeah. okay, I think this is the foundation of the art, and I showed it to him. And he's all, yeah, that's okay. You know, so I made an art, I made a curriculum here from white belt to black belt based on all our okay. personal stuff. But, uh, wow. So we're, I mean, I guess as far as he's concerned, 
I guess, because it sounds like he's due recognition. Where did he learn from? Did he ever share that? Yeah, he was. So he was taking Roomba Kai Karate. At, I think he was taking some form of Roomba Kai Karate at the time. I don't know who his instructor was. Maybe Ron could, Ron was good friends with him, Ron Saturno. So he probably knows more of that history. But um, actually, his parent, his dad was a farm labor contractor. So in GM Art, when he worked out on the ranches and stuff, I mean, he had access to a lot of the Filipinos who were working there in the fields along with the, with the Mexicans and Hispanics, you know. And so um, that's, I think, where he met him. There's actually, he said he met Dino working there. And I guess Dino noticed that he had like a, some sort of karate symbol on his shirt. And Dino said, no, do you, you know, yeah. you do martial arts or whatever. And Art said, yeah, you know. And, he, and then Dino said, do you want to play? You know, and apparently Art had a friend there and he, who also did the art. He's like, all right, kick his ass, Art, you know. And I guess he went to go do a kick and he just like sectored out of the way. And next thing you knew, he had kind of was knocked him out. And as he kind of opened his eyes, he saw him walking away, you know. And so it's funny is uh, this guy by the name of Louis Ambriz, he's making a documentary on Stockton FMA. And we actually, I helped choreograph that fight scene of when Jim really? Martin, you know, yeah, so it's a project that he's been working on. It's near and dear to his heart because Stockton's not really known for good, you know, other than FMA. And so he wants to really just highlight the gem of the different FMA styles that came out of oh Stockton. Oh, my God. When's this That's coming out? I don't know. I mean, COVID really put a, a damper on it, but yeah. he's done a lot of interviews he's, and he's talked to people, so... Uh, I don't know where he's at with the project, but I know the last thing I worked with him probably, I don't know, several months ago, we did that that scene where we had someone who looked like Dino and mm. have choreograph. Actually, Master Joel Juanita's son Leo played played art. You know, I think he played art okay. doing the doing the kicks and stuff like that. So, but that was fun. Wow. I, the first time I'm hearing this, that's fantastic that they're uh, making a movie. I, I hope it comes to, to our tradition. I, I really do. That's, I mean, that's long overdue, you know? Yeah. He's already had some interviews out there, and I can't remember. Uh, forgive me. I just, I can't remember. I know Jim uh, Carlito, he's interviewed. He has a, an interview out there on the web somewhere. He could probably tell you in the chat what, what the name of that whole project is. But it's pretty exciting. Uh -huh. I can't wait. Yeah, I, I hope it. Well, I hope it plays out. I mean, that's man. So, is there a particular range? It doesn't sound like based on all the modules you're telling me about. So it sounds like it wasn't really range specific. Your system there? Well, there's we do medio, largo, corto, corto, the medio, medio, the largo, largo, the corto. So those are the three ranges. We still have the three primary ranges. Then we have our master circle, which incorpor incorporates some of the Spanish fencing to you know to flank and come around and get outside. You know, and so I may touch a little bit on that. And, um, but a lot of it too is also, you know, the, the where this was in kind of tight and close. You know, if I'm mm. in the center line and if I'm in tight and close, basically I can catch everything from the center line where you're coming from. And yeah. so, you know, and then you have the sticky stuff where if they come back, if I give them a one and they come back, I just write it out. You know, I'll okay. just write it, write it out and follow up with something and, now my range will be dictated. If I'm close, I'll come back straight from about here mm. of, of my weapon. But if I want to go far, I may not write it out and I may jab out a thrust. And so we'll talk a little bit about that. But um, And then I use the part that I really like is the stick boxing where I utilize everything. You know, We have different defenses where first defense is fists, second defense is, is the forearm, third is here, my elbow, fourth, fifth, sixth hip go down to the knees, mm -hmm. seven, eighth, ninth, tenth, down my legs. Yeah. And everything I do, I'm using all these different defensive. I'm coming here for a pack. I'm using my fifth defense to strike. Mm -hmm. and coming here, using my third, coming here, breaking the arm, using my fourth defense. And so I'll talk about that. So those are the concepts and principles of of how we strike with the body and our different defenses. Um, That's awesome. Matter of fact, Guru Terry just mentioned City on the Edge. That's it. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah city on the edge. Yeah, so check that out. That's that's going to be cool. I think when it comes out. Oh God, I, I I hope it does. I would love to get somebody on an interview on that. I I, I think it's yeah. just so well overdue. I mean, that's I think that city should have been covered decades ago. But I, at least it sounds like it's happening. I mean, yeah, if you could talk to that guy, I mean, 
because I know yeah. he's talked to quite a few people already in the in the interview process, but I don't know where he's yeah. at with status. So. Yeah, I'm so glad it's happening. So, uh, Master Curly, there. Yes, yeah, City on the Edge, director Louis Armbriz. Okay. All right. All right. Um, so, have you done, you know, with the exception of that, I know it sounds like you pretty much say there, have, have you ever, like, checked out any other systems that you trained in or just out of curiosity or anything? Other systems as far as, as FMA? As FMA? Oh, yeah, I did call Lee for a while at my work. I work at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And um, I mean, people are going to hate me when I say this, but we have a dojo on site. Really? And, yeah, we have a dojo on site. And that's where I'm actually getting my ranking in Kaju Kempo is at lunch during work. Uh, oh my Professor gosh. Peterson, who's under the Ramos lineage of Kaju Kempo. But I took okay. uh, Kali there. There was a guy doing Kali. His name was Guru Jim Collins. And I can't recall the name of that particular system that he was learning from but it was definitely a longer longer weapon you know okay. we, we tend to use like a 28 inch stick it was more of a 32 and a, like an axe handle so everything is very long because it's a heavier weapon and so i took that for a couple of years with him excuse me studying that particular system and then you know i was fortunate enough where gm art was friends with you know ron saturno frank riamas mm -hmm. you know carlito bonjock and um these these folks would come in and you know they we got to play with them and they would show us some stuff or you know and then we also were involved with Kilohana organization martial uh, martial arts organization so we got to cross train in different things as well you know it must have been just so so amazing you know when you look back at that like you know you had those folks coming in and it right. just seems like that's going away it's just i don't know it seems sad I don't know. yeah but unfortunately you know but even at the time when you're young and naive you don't realize the gift the magnitude of who's magnitude before you know? and that's kind of why i started up this vea martial arts collaborative where i bring in eight instructors twice a year and and we we share you know it's an opportunity mm. for people to say show us what you want to show us regarding your system and pay honor to your instructors by teaching something you know and I'm yeah. I'm really blessed with the amount of support I've had with with that and the amount of people who want to come share their art with everyone. Mm. You know, so that's yeah, what we're going to cover that. Um, so when did you actually start? Like when were you given the blessing? I guess to start teaching. Um, probably around two thousand nine, somewhere in there. I was taking Koshiru Kempo, and really I, that's when I just started teaching. I. Uh, I was studying, I was under Sensei Larry Akaya. So this school here where I teach out of is the VEA Martial Arts Academy. His daughter owns the school. She runs mm. the business here. Her name's Amy Akaya. And so Sensei Larry Akaya was my Kempo, Koshiru Kempo instructor along with Sensei Jason Cortez. And, um, you know, we would, I was green belt, purple belt, somewhere in there, I can't remember. But we'd have to do ad libs. And all my ad libs after doing a technique follow up, I would do FMA. You know, yeah. I would do something and he'd say, you know something. What do you, what do you study? You know, I just <laughs> myself and, and I said, oh, I do a scream on. So we, that turned into me teaching the black belt club there, you know, some okay. FMA stuff. So that was probably around 2009, 2010. Then I had coworkers. I ran a martial arts club at work and I taught FMA. My good friend, uh, Professor Jimmy Mirador taught um, Kaju, Kem Kaju Kempo. And then my other friend, uh, Dean Simmons, he had a sash in, in Kung Fu and also Kaju Kempo with the P. And so the three of us were the instructors. And so we would come together and we create a, a kind of a, in lunchtime, we create a, a martial arts club. And this was, the, really? this was a different DOE contractor besides the lab. Yeah, so yeah. that's kind of where I started really appreciating the cross sharing and the, the pollination of ideas, you know, and how much better you could become by just examining stuff and that's you know like your show you get people on there and, you know there's a lot of similarities but every once in a while you get that nugget you know you're like yeah oh wow that little subtlety right there i like yeah. that you know yeah, there's been a lot of nuggets that come on this show yeah oh, I, can, <laughs> I can imagine there's been a lot i mean and hopefully they'll continue but um so for now though is it is it pretty much you're just teaching their cordis pretty much or yeah, I just pretty much teach the cordas. If I teach something else, I pay homage to this isn't like, I'll take a call drill. We do a footwork thing. I go, this comes from Guru Jim Collins. 
Okay, this is a Kali, this is not our Dikmanas. So the first thing I always want to do is recognize where it came from. And then I tell why I think it's important. I say I like this because it's a flanking drill. You're learning how to mm -hmm. flank and get to the outside. And it teaches you how to move your body if you were to happen to have a longer weapon that's heavier than what we traditionally use. Okay. You know? And so I, I say this is just, well, the way I, I thought I said, this is nugget information for you. You're not going to be tested on it, you know, except for the, yeah, right. okay. the Kali drill. You know, I may say, okay, you're going to be tested on this just so you, if you see, if you understand the concept behind it. You know, but I, right. I do a lot of that. Yeah, I, I, I yeah. where I see it fit, I incorporate some stuff. Yeah, uh, I think that you're exposing it more, and furthermore, giving credit to where it came from. I mean, yeah, yeah but about 2009, 2010, I had a student named Travis Pond. He was a coworker, and he wanted me to teach him privately, and I was not really to teach. And then one day, I just he got I got tired of his pestering because he was taking it at work, and he's like, I want to learn more. I want to learn. And I was like, well. Come to my house on a Sunday and I'll start. So he, sure enough, I tell my wife, there's this dude that might show up. You know, we're drinking coffee, getting ready to get watch the, you know, getting ready for NFL football or whatever. And sure enough, my doorbell rings and there's Travis. There he is. Hey, I'm here to train. Let's go, guru. And so I started training him on the side of my house. My neighbors heard. They want, he sent over his son to train with me. And oh. then before then it just grew from the side of my house you know at the time i was yeah. I had school from stockton manteca i just started to take camp over because i wanted to make friends here and the only place i knew was a dojo you know where i mm. kind of find people with similar interests and um and then about that time i let gm art know that i have a group of people that i'm starting to teach and he goes oh great so then gm art would come out to my house and mm. um you know he would come with george and and train some you know train my student base that i started there and that's kind of where he's like Okay, yeah. If you want, you have my blessing to teach, you know. And oh, okay. yeah. And then 2014 is when he gave me my master's uh, certification, which, which I'm extremely humbled by that, is because I, I have Michael Horon's signature on it, and I have Vincent Cabalas' signature on wow. it. Wow. The other legends on it, you know, and so that doesn't get lost on me to know. Oh my God, those two right there. Matter of fact, I'm hoping to get. Uh, Jim Vincent uh, next month. Um, oh, good. That's uh, that's amazing. Uh, wow. Yeah, so. Um, so what age? So you teach? I'm assuming you teach ages. Like what ages do you teach? About thirteen and up. You know, because because we have some edge weapon stuff. You know, some of the stuff mm. gets a little gory and. You, mean, you don't want to teach six year olds that? No, I teach my kids that, but not, <laughs> but not uh, someone else's kids at that age. You yeah, know, that, the maturity level has to be right. You know, it's not just anything. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, it's the, the maturity level's got to be right, and and, and uh, but I'm really careful on what I show to to the younger mm. And The only time I go under that, where I break that rule, is if they're a, a child of one of my students. You know, like Tony's kids, they come here, and you know. Some of them, you know, they yeah. started when they're under 13. And so, yeah. Yeah, that's, um, yeah, it's funny. It's uh, like, and I always teach, when I had my school, I sold it in 2012. When I had it in early 2000s, when I was teaching FMA under using the Atienza uh, pilot program, they just got sick. Like, there's no way I'm giving edge weapons, man. No. Yeah. <laughs> you know I mean, it's just, just no way. You know what I mean? It's just, uh, yeah, there has to be that aid, that responsibility. Right. You know, with kids and all that before you get a phone call that jimmy in the recess uh you know. that's right gutted someone 17 times right oh my gosh yeah you know what i mean um but uh so what's your ranking i guess what's your ranking structure for the uh your students so i have a brown belt a white belt all the way up to third degree black i'm a right now i'm currently a fourth degree black master instructor and when i started with gmr we didn't have ranking mm -hmm. so the way that that's even a funny story so because we cross trained the kilohana organization some of the folks are there like art your students come up and they just come dressed in black you know they just come in sweats and no one knows what the ranking is and you know we it's the only reason they want to know ranking is just how experienced someone is so when they're working with them you know we can decrease the chance of injury you know mm -hmm. so one day gmr came in with a bag i don't know we had all these belts but he looked around the room and he's like, oh, George, yeah, you're, I like to do him like a, you know, you go, there's a blue Mikey, belt. you're, yeah, here, you're blue. You know, so he was just throwing like belts at people. And that's kind of how it officially started. And even then yeah. we didn't have like geese. It was just like, okay, we came with our black sweats and they were going to put the belt, 
you know, tie the belt on over our sweatpants or something. But that's kind of where I the mean, belt came from. But it is a good way. I mean, I understand why people use it. <clears throat> it right. is a good way to, you know, know where your students are at. I mean, I get it. You know, whether you're doing beginner, intermediate, advanced, you know, or, you know, or you go, you know, that. But the belts, you know, I can understand it. You, you know what I mean? The use the use of them, you know? Right. So, um, but, uh, so, uh, so you have like, you know, some, uh, assistant teacher assistants helping you and everything. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a couple of gurus. I have, so I have four black belt, um, graduates. One is, um, so Travis Pond, Guru Travis Pond, his son, Guru Seamus Pond, who went off to the Marine mm -hmm. Corps. He's now out, but he was a Marine. Um, I then have Robert May, Guru Robert May, who's my head instructor now, teaches still out of here and trains here. Uh, his son, Quentin, who became a Navy corpsman. So he's still mm -hmm. in the Navy. Mm -hmm. um, and then I have Tony, the bull over here, who's kind of on that long journey, who started out not really caring about rank, but he's probably been with me just as long as the other folks I mentioned. Um, okay. But yeah, so I, I've, got a, I've got a good core, and then I've got a group of new folks that came in here. That's awesome. So um, no, awesome, awesome. What uh, I was going to say there, you know, as far as what do you try, I guess, what's important to you as far as what you instill in your students and with, with respects to their journey? Well, I guess, the, the, you know, the first one was it's okay to fail. Mm -hmm. You know, this is what we do here. This is where we exercise and we vet things. This is where it's okay to screw up. This is okay mm -hmm. when you're with your brethren here too and also explore you know this is kind of the so i the first thing i want to know is that you're going to be challenged but if you fail it's okay because then you just can keep studying you know and that, that's another reason why i like the, the belt system for my younger students is because yeah. they may not pass but to, yeah. in the end that that makes them more resilient because they have to come back they have to study what they didn't know and mm -hmm. then when they do pass they i think they have a, a better sense of confidence you know, and I think over time, an accomplishment. Think, yeah, right? accomplishment. And so it makes them more resilient folks in society. So when they actually get mm -hmm. a real job and they face adversity, you know. Yeah, there you go. Imagine you know? that adversity. You know, it yeah. could happen. It could happen, right? <laughs> yeah, everything's not in this bubble, this TikTok bubble, you know. Or, you know, I not mean, everyone's going to be a you know an influencer. You know, you may have yeah, to be a job not in a positive food. way. <laughs> yeah. So, to me, that's really. I feel like I have a big responsibility for that, you know, is yeah. in martial arts. I think when you, once you get into it and you've been in it for a, a long time, I think you realize it's not just about, you know, cutting, punching, kicking, striking, mm -hmm. grabbing and pulling. It's, it's all about, it's, it's probably the one to me, it's one of the best ways to mentally condition yourself for adversity, you know, for, the real, so. for the real world. I totally agree, especially with young folks in character development um like you said goal you know goal orientation you know adversity which you mentioned you know, yeah world, yeah and stress uh, and stress you know when you're under duress or you're in a, you're in a work environment and someone's being a little hostile to you but they haven't put any hands on you they're just upset about something you're able to for me i'm able to stay calm and collected i'm like okay yeah right. yeah like yeah you're just more like hey everything okay you yeah know, you're, you're like, okay you're you challenging me? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, I guess that's why I, I try to get across, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. definitely. And I also want oh. them to know that, you know, there are other art systems. I'm just giving you concepts and principles to make you a better martial artist, you mm -hmm. know. And so when I bring in these folks here to teach something, watch what they do and see how you can incorporate your decorless base into what they're showing you, you know. And I always try to find ways to be more efficient, you know. Like if I'm striking, I don't want to pull all the way back, you know, because really yeah. now I've done is just created more of a window for them to counter me, you know, as, mm -hmm. as opposed to just being here and then dropping my weight for my strike or something, you know. So those mm -hmm. all those little nuggets like that that I try to share with them, you know. Yeah, yeah, awesome. So, how do you um, how do you introduce sparring? I mean, do you introduce gradually in gradual increments, depending? I do it gradually, you know. Honestly, I do it gradually and. And I think it's because you, you get, what happens is mentally, you have to prepare the student mentally for it. You know, at a young age, most of us are taught, don't hit, don't punch, don't, don't bite. Hey, you were biting little Tommy, don't do that. 
you know, so they're not accustomed to striking another human a lot of times, you know, mm -hmm. and so you got to, and then they're not used to getting hit, you know, so it mm -hmm. starts out gradually where we may do like through our boxing, our Gonzalez boxing, our USA is what's called, what's referred to as universal striking applications is we're just, all we're doing is taking blocks and taking hits, but that's conditioning you to getting hit, to getting touched. Mm -hmm. you know? So it starts out there. And then over time, as they get right about the middle rankings of, you know, yellow belt and mid ranking of our system, that's how we start incorporating more of the, of the sparring, but definitely a transition. Yeah. Yeah, sounds like it's a good good way how you introduce it and, and so forth. You know. Yeah, I mean? and, you know, and there's other folks that get them right from the ground going. You know, as soon as they can walk, they're sparring. And you know, it's whatever works for you. But for me, I've noticed for my students, I think I need to, I kind of need to let them know where I'm going with it. You know, and get them mentally. Yeah. Kind of like a precursor. You yeah, know you're I mean? gonna get that adrenaline dump. You're gonna get all that all that psychological things that come overcomes your body, and, and now you're just surviving, mm -hmm. and they're not really learning. They're just trying not to, just yeah. trying to survive the encounter rather than saying, oh, here comes a strike. I'm going to counter. I'm going to react or I'm going to engage or I'm going to, you know, I want their yeah. mind to be in a different place where they can actually analyze what's happening during sparring. Yeah. So it's not, doesn't become a negative or an adverse effect on them where maybe now they don't even want to ever approach it again because the initial experience was so terrible. You know yeah. I mean? Yeah, that's right. So, yeah. I mean, it's probably long. It takes us longer to get there to where I want to be, but I think at the end, you end up having folks who are a lot more calm under duress. I think so, yeah. And, and you're naturally building on stress inoculation as opposed to maybe you were, it was so overwhelming in the beginning, the student leaves and quits and, and yeah. nobody's nobody's winning, you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, um, but uh, hey, I'm ready for the demos. Okay. Um, I'm excited, man. So yeah, again, show what you want and uh, I'm gonna minimize myself so you'll have All right. the whole landscape. So. Well, before I do that, I'm going to talk about what we got here. Can can you see the entire board here? Yeah, but I'm going to here. I'm going to drop this out. If you want, you could bring it closer. Okay, there that's we go. better. Yeah. All right. So just real quick, when I'm going to do my demo, these are the different concepts of principles I'm going to touch on. One of them is called the master circle. We're going to talk about the three psychological attitudes from how I respond to attack. Depending on how my attacker is attacking me, is going to determine what type of uh, psychological attitude I'm going to come at them we refer to those as the tres caballeros I'm going to talk about beats zero beat one beat two beat and three beat and explain what those are I'm going to type talk about the type of strikes we have a full swing through strike we have a chopping strike or a rebounding strike and then we have a stay strike where I might leave it there to work some entanglements um, we're going to talk about these different angles and patterns that show up you know the figure eight the circle sectors and quadrants um, sectoring when I parry out here I'm throwing them into a different sector so that actually lets me know what they're gonna come back at because now that I split their body in half they can only come at me with certain angles here so I'm actually buying time by my pairing principles here and then in gynos in gynos are baits where I may set them up and bait them to do something so I'm gonna show some in gynos with some knife stuff and then I don't want my attacker to be comfortable so I'm gonna talk about why it's important to destroy the base and disrupt body structure uh, high and low gates are salute uh, levers triangles and pivot points you know as as bodies as bipeds we have these pivot points in the elbow the wrist you know and they all have a certain stopping point and how we take advantage of that in our fma uh the wave i'm going to talk a little bit about this the wave drill and go into a little more uh details of why that's important clock theory you know how we apply the clock from the low to the mid to the high and how i push their arms in different positions of their body I can take advantage of destroying their base and locking their skeletal system. Sticky, sticky, that's that riding out, kind of the sticky hands, but riding out the stick and then finding the opportunity to engage in a strike. And then oscillating torso, um, you know, removing your center line off of the mass and um, using your body to destroy them. So all, these are all the principles that I'm going to try to cover as quick as I can in some sort of demo. So we're going to move this off to the side and we're going to get started. Folks, if there's anything in particular you want to see, uh, just put it in the comment section. Okay. So, let me get this out of the way. <clears throat> so, this is our school, by the way. We're in Manteca, California. This is the Cheer Academy. This is where I have that big event, the VA Martial Arts Collaborative Cross here. It's about a 4,000 square foot facility, so you can see we can fit a lot of people here. 
Um, so the first thing I'm going to start off, first, this is my sister Tony, Tony Valdez. Okay, so we're going to go off, we're going to talk about the zero beat, one beat, two beat, and three beat. So if Tony were to punch me, my zero beat's total evasion. Okay? Zero beat is a total evasion. I'm getting out of the way he punches at me, boom, I'm striking. Okay, I'm striking. My one beat is my parry becomes my strike. You kind of mean? Boom. I'm parrying and I'm striking. Okay. So he punches, I parry, I strike. Okay. That's the one beat. The two beat is more of a split. I could split here. I'm striking as I parry. He punches again. I'm striking as I parry. Okay. The three beat is going to be a parry, a check with strike. Could be here. Okay. That's a three beat. So one more time. Zero beat, total evasion. One beat carries a strike. Two beat is a split. You split here. Three beat is that way. It's a parry check strike. All these things I'm showing you empty hand actually ties to a spot adaga, whether I come in with a one beat, zero beat, two beat, or three beat. If you were to throw two punches, I can mix up the combination. So the first one, zero, zero. I start incorporating my master circle. So if I slow that down, zero, okay. I got away the punch and I keep, turning, I keep walking. Zero beat, total evasion and striking. The one beat, he goes, parry, he goes again, boom. I parried out, followed by a strike. My parry is my strike, or I parry and strike. Okay, here, two beat. What is that? So here, here, boom, two beat. Here, boom, three beat. Boom, three beat. Okay. So that's some basic principles of the zero, one, two, three. And then we talk about our angles. Uh, stick, Tony. So we're gonna talk about the wave right now. So when Tony's gonna block for this one strike, I come at him, okay? He's creating a triangle. You notice he's creating, when he does that, he's creating a triangle. We call it the wave is because here goes the wave. And like most FMA system, we have nautical terms for whatever reason, okay? He has to turn the bow of the ship to face that wave. He doesn't want to be here, okay? He wants to turn his bow, get a nice triangle brace, stay close and tight, okay? And I'm going to swing at him, okay? I come with the two, okay? Come three, four, overhead, okay? You notice he's creating these triangles. There's a triangle here for the overhead. Slight step out, triangle here, meaning that wave here. Here, you can catch the vertical if you want it down. But right now, we're just catching here to catch the three and four as opposed to down. Now, the reason that's important is because this is a blocking strike. Blocking is our least desirable option. So we evade before we parry, we parry before we pass, and we pass before we block, and blocking is our least desirable option. But that doesn't mean we don't practice a blocking drill. Okay? So he comes in here. If I were to swing through, he could counter, boom, there's his window of opportunity because I swung through, okay? Mm -hmm. Boom, he could take me out because I swung through. So depending on your attack, okay? Or he could follow through. So if he gave me a one, I can block, he goes through, I can hit, or I can simply drive my, I can throttle through, you see that? I can throttle through, like if I'm in my boat, the waves come, I throttle through and I attack. And this is just from a one, he comes in here, Okay, so that's some principles behind the wave. Now, some sticky hand stuff. If I go here slow, he comes with the two, I can ride it out and then I can chop him here. Okay, so one more time, I go here, boom, I ride him out. The three comes, see, I'm riding them out. So that's where I'm, I talked about being here in the center. I can ride things out. Go ahead and get your headgear off and your gloves. <clears throat> so, one more time, the wave here, creating the triangle. Boom, 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 boom. Um, now what Tony's going to do is I'm going to show you some of our Degorla stick boxing. The tres caballeros are the three psychological attitudes. Our aggressive attitudes here, that's caballero one, where I'm just, boom, I'm just very aggressive. Caballero two is I'm here. I may want to bait them, create some engaños while I'm trying to get them to hit this, and then I might come out. Gabriel 3 is more of the leery. I don't know what they know, so I'm just going to try to catch them long. Okay? But I can go from long 
come into medio to come into corpo with these three different attitudes. Okay, each one of these attitudes has a body starting position. Position one, position two, position three. Okay, so what I'm going to show you now is some of a lot of systems. While I teach concepts and principles, we do still have some techniques. What I'm going to show right now is some are the cuerdas stick boxing and the cuerdas outside number one. Okay. So Tony here, he's going to come center of my head. So my job is to do a evasion and strike. So going back to the empty hand thing, it's really a zero beat. Or probably consider more of a one beat because my parry is my strike. So he's coming at me here. Okay. So what happened if I slow that down is I'm attacking him here. I get off the center line, but I'm attacking him. Okay. So the first one looks like this. And then I'm just going to open it. Okay. So before this one looks like this. Okay. I'm just taking his head out. The strike is here. I'm taking it out. I'm going overhead. The next part is I'm going to use all my weapons to bear. So I have my puño, my fist, medio, punto of the stick, and then I have this. Okay, so it looks like this. Okay, so you see I did the slow it down. One, two, three. Okay, the next one is here, here, is, I'm gonna strike for this one. From here, this goes to the throat. Okay, he's got the glove on, but I'm taking out. Take him out. Pivot points. I may do a strike. Boom. The reason he went down is if I slow it down, here, here, punch. This comes here. First defense, second defense, my wrist. I'm taking here, air and blood strike. As I turn, you see, this brings his chin up, which turns his skeletal structure. So if you imagine my stick is his spine, I want his spine to go like that. So I'm always destroying his base and his skeletal structure. I could turn, spin, twist. Here's a pivot point. If I turn the chin, the neck, he's going to have to start turning. You see how he starts turning? Okay. That's our symbol in the back of our symbol. I don't have it on this shirt. It's in the, maybe here. There's like a circle. Well, if I keep turning and twisting that circle, that's a principle. So one more time, what could be here? Boom, here. As I hit up, I can bring back my puño down to the top of the chest and I do a strike, boom, okay? Now, if I want to get behind him, here, I turn around, hit. I strike that way, okay? Our number eight push, he could come here, boom, touch, push, boom. okay? The whole time I want him to be like he's in the dishwasher because when he's uncomfortable and if he's doing this, he can't counter. So another one could be, I go here, boom, I headbutt him, good defense, okay? If I walk down the line, Okay, second defense. Third defense is elbow. Okay, fourth defense. Boom. See this? I'm being nice to him, but I would have kept it up here. From my elbow, this location, taking that head strike. Mm. So that is some constants and principles behind our stick boxing. I haven't punched with this yet, but it could be. Boom. I'm using all aspects of my weapons to bear. Okay, so that's some of our stick boxing. Another one could be here. I'm coming around here. I'm breaking the ribs. Mm. Pushing in, breaking the ribs. And I push them off. Boom, and I strike. So that's the very, you can see how aggressive that is. At the same time, I could simply just want to go and pass through and not engage in a linear battle here. Okay, I want to just pass through. Okay, good, Tony? Yes, sir. 
Okay, let's put that way. Any questions about that? No, great so far. Yeah, keep showing what you want to show. I'm going to move pretty quickly here because I'm going to try to. We talked about beats and rhythms. We talked about um, physical attitudes, the psychological attitudes, rescaleros. We talked about destroying the base and body structure. And I haven't even incorporated my dio steps yet. So let me get here. Some dio stepping would be here. If this legs forward, here's a dio step. One, so I'm buckling that knee. Two, three, four. Okay, this one goes up this way. Five. So these are all entry and footwork. We call them gyro steps or rooster steps. Okay, those could be, if I do punches, I'm coming in here, I make gyro step here, I can collapse. Okay, so those are some other empty, empty things. We have sweeps, we have striking, locking, throwing, choking, sweeping, grabbing arts. Someone will say, What's a grabbing art? Well, he punches, I come here, I grab on his uh. Okay? And I just rip that. Okay, and then from there I go into my USA boxing. Or I take the sweep. So more time, that can look at his. I grab here, <laughs> sweep. Okay. <laughs> and the entire time, I'm actually all my strikes are striking towards vital organs. Pressure uh, points of vital organs. So this okay. is part of our art as well, that is like basically this. Right in here, he punches. Okay, that's going this way with the cheese, disrupting this way. Okay, going here. Um, about the square pattern, there's a square pattern. So when I have my weapon, say if I came in here, he stops it. He just stops it with whatever he wants. <clears throat> I can cut on the outside. So picture a square around his, his arm. I can cut on the outside, slide in. I cut from underneath, come up. I can cut from the inside up. I can cut from the top in. Okay, so I created a square. So if this fist is going to get close. So, so. so if he stopped it here, I can come this way, this way, this way, this way. Okay, and all that turns into a fillet. Okay. Mm. Okay, let's cut from underneath. Got it? So those are counters. What's nice about that is we practice a parry technique. So first thing is parrying out, okay? Everyone's seen some, some, some version of this, of this parry. Okay? Now I teach engaños. Engaños is where I'll do a technique where I rotate my pattern. So if he comes for this inside, parry. As soon as I feel that touch, I'm gonna come under and cut. Okay, one more time. Boom, I come under, I cut. Ripping that bicep. Okay, one more time. Here. Whew. And I'm always coming back to center. Then I come to, he comes across the period out. I come on top. Boom. Cut. He comes straight to parry it out. I feel that parry. Boom. I come on top. Cut. He comes here. Boom. I cut. Okay, he goes with five. He parries out however once. I come on top. Cut. I haven't yet interjected the helping hand. Mm -hmm. Same drill. He comes here. As I come to cut. Remember, I'm always trying to disrupt his body structure. I can either disrupt it by pushing the head, turning that pivot point in the head, or taking the pivot point on the ankles. Okay, so as he goes in here, and I come on here, okay? And I'm always here, down in center. Okay, so one more time, I let him do the parry. And this is kind of how I might teach a drill. Okay, they practice the drill, they're honing that skill. Then they have to learn, as they get advanced, this in guidance. Okay, the time the guy that was the bait. Comes here. Okay, here, boom, cut. Here, cut. And I'm always after that cut, inserting to center mass or towards the top. And that's a square pattern. Another pattern you'll see that's pretty similar is the figure eight pattern or the X pattern. Okay. The beauty about the figure eight or X pattern, and once again, everybody who's out there, this is just providing you ideas or concepts. Some of this you've probably seen before, but some of it you might say, huh, that might be a different way to teach it, or I never thought about that, okay? Because once again, the cordless is a vehicle to provide you concepts and principles. So, the figure eight. Um, get in line, get in line. So if he were to shoot a six at me, okay, I push him out this way. That sectored him out that way. The advantage of doing that is now all of a sudden I have foresight into what his next strike's gonna be because I dictated where I was going to put him. 
my parry dictated. Now I have a simple parry where he goes here. I parried him there. But that wasn't really effective because I didn't destroy his base. Ideally, I parry and I push out. That destroys his base. Right? Now the figure eight pattern can come in. I cut and I push. See that circle of the man that I had there? I pushed. And look at now what I have here. Technically, if I just push here, I could drop him because his skeletal system's locked. But that window of opportunity is brief because no one's going to stay in a twisted state like that. Mm -hmm. You have to know when to apply the technique. So it looks like this. And I'm using these. This Some people call it the, the Elvis. I'm doing this stuff. Okay? The Elvis. Hips, and I'm using my legs <laughs> to destroy the base as he's turned. Um, one of the base, high doors, another point, three points, oscillating torso. One thing we also have is this oscillating torso. This movement right here is very effective for what we do here because if he comes in and punches at me, if I go here, I oscillate this way. Okay, when I oscillate back, I oscillate to a punch. Okay, um. Some of our Bruno grappling girls, he punches. Okay. I'm throwing this one using clock theory. Straight down, we call it zero clock. I'm using my base. So rather than doing, say, on what is it, a sort of Ari or something, I'm going to come in here. I got to disrupt the skeletal system. Then I oscillate and drop my weight. Okay. He has a hard time keeping this fat belly and this weight of mine up. So. I turn, I drop my weight. Do you notice the entire time I'm doing this capture? Like head buddy. If he has to fight out, I back this amount, boom, I sectored him there. So now I'm ready to engage again. So, for example, if I catch a one, I push him out. Boom. He's fighting out. I know when to engage him again. He calls an underhook. It's a break. Okay, from here's our takedown. Okay. So underhooks, overhooks. If he were to come in at me for say number four to my stomach, boom. Same principle. I'm coming in here. Possibly torso. As I'm trying to break that arm, I want to dislocate the shoulder. And I'm using a lot of my fourth defense, but I'm oscillating. <clears throat> That's important when you look at stuff like this. Okay. So now we're taking FMA, foundational base, applying principles to more modern. Kind of situation. Mm -hmm. Okay, here, and then I guess I'm just gonna do this disclaimer. Kids don't try this at home. Last resort situation, blah, 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 all that stuff. <laughs> when I'm in here, I get off center line. I oscillate it this way. I'm gonna turn this way as I oscillate this way. Okay. <clears throat> Gun to the back. I could be here. If I oscillate this way, I close this gap. I'm going to oscillate this way. Okay. Flexible weapon. Rope. I can use a one, a zero beat entry or one beat entry just to start this. And once again, I'm just going to show you some concepts. He punches at me. I'm here. Yes. Okay. That's a one, uh, two beat entry. I'm going to come around here. This is where I grab. Zero beat entry as I turn. <laughs> Okay, this is where I have my choke coming on. Okay? If you throw in two punches, parry, boom, pop, strike. This right over here. Okay? So these are just some things we could do. Don't really have all day to go over it, but uh, does that kind of give you a little flavor of, of some of the Decuela stuff? Oh, 100%. Okay. One hundred percent. Yeah. Um, yeah. A couple. Of th yeah. A couple of things. I guess we're gonna, now that I kind of real quickly ran through the gamut of stuff. Yeah. I would just like to give you guys a few minutes if anyone had questions. Sure. Sure. Um, can you just do that thing again with your pension? No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, the, just, yeah. the tit grab. No, I'm just kidding. Um, yeah, just a couple. Of, I, you know, I, the things that I really like what you articulated on the sectoring where you're throwing that out and then creating that predictability where it's coming back. I thought that was well, well said. Yeah. And um, 
and that. So that was something really is. I like the the side body lock. I mean, um, um, I like clinch, so that resonated okay. with me. Um, and then just on the, uh, on, what was I gonna say there? Like, I think it's really for sensitivity, and I run my guys to it. Like, okay, hey, I want you just to try to cut me, but you can't use this hand. I really mm. want you to feel where the loops and yes. I'm pushing you. Or, I think that's so valuable. And now when they do put the other hand in, man, it's just like, like that. I mean, it's, you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, yeah. when you do it, you know, when you do that, when you're riding and you're doing that sticky hand stuff, it's funny. It's just, you'll start to hone that skill, you know? And, and then what's nice about it is we're not always going to be in a lighted venue like this. You know, mm -hmm. you may be low light level. All of a sudden you feel something, you know, for example, if he came here and it's say Grab a knife. What's your one? Okay. He came here and he threw at me. Once, once I'm in here, I can feel whether he goes high or mm -hmm. low, I can feel what he's doing. And so I'm saying that, and by practicing that drill, where say we're just here, he's gonna punch at me. Okay, I'm gonna punch at you, light it up. Okay. This is all we're doing. And so you can feel where that opening is, right? You can feel where mm -hmm. that opening is. See, and like Tony did, he's a good student, he didn't want to get kicked in the a punch in the face so he knew to ride that back out okay but that's when my engaños come in okay yeah he already knows the engaño so he knows where i'm trying to get him but you're right that's i think it's really i don't think no i do i yeah. think knife training is just so invaluable and what you just showed for empty hand i just think um the bridge to it i i just i just think it's invaluable yeah i mean it's just yeah oh, thank you thank you sir um yeah so that was nicely done like you know, again, uh, you know, where get them so acute in there. And now when this comes into play, I mean, it's going to be like game over. You know, right, yeah. Mean? He's like, oh, you called yeah. the Calvary in, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Back up coming in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I guess that's the one thing, too, that really gravitate to the Cuevas is the, our heavy use of empty hands in, in the knife. Yeah. You know, so I always say we do more than just play with sticks. It's pretty, it's a pretty well rounded system. Yeah, I'm definitely seeing it as far as all the stuff you cover. I also like, too, with the rope. Like, you're not trying to necessarily catch the punch. You're dealing with the punch first, deal with the yeah. threat first, and then seek an opportunity after that. Like, I thought, yeah. yeah. Well, because the reality is I'm not going to be able to catch this punch out of straight. That's what I mean. But you see, the, yeah. I know. No, I'm with you 100%. Yeah. But, you, but, you know, you see, you know, you see some of that stuff out there, yeah. man. They're catching this and they're catching, you know. And, yeah, uh, right, right. Yeah, so I appreciated that. I thought that was well done. Then when you get inside, yeah, now you loop or whatever and, right. and stuff like that. Um, yeah, excellent. And I mean, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. Comments coming in, um, speak to the same there. Uh, so yeah, I salute to both of you on that. Um, Thank you. So this event, so I want to talk about this big event. I didn't know it was biannually, first off. Uh, secondly, I didn't know to the magnitude of how many folks you got coming to there. So before I get into there, I guess uh, what, you know, motivated you? What was the inspiration for you creating this? And when did it start? Um, so what really motivated me is going back to where I talked about early on how we cross chain in Kilohana. And uh, what motivated me early on was that I know I didn't have an appreciation then as I got older, I did. GMR actually started an event called the Martial Arts Cultural Exchange. So in 2011 was our really first event where we brought in multiple folks um, mm -hmm. and we started cross training in different systems. And so what he did is it was two part. Part of it was also to give FMA a voice, you know, to give them a platform to share. So at first it started out with FMA with FMA people. A lot of us kind of knew what we were doing. You know, and so what we wanted to do then is let's start bringing some of the traditional arts and showing them what we have, you know, so that's kind of where we ended up going with it. So now mm -hmm. you come to one of my events, I may have a Kaju, a Kempo, a Tai Chi, uh, a Kung Fu, a Salat, mm -hmm. you know, even though that's kind of Indonesian and kind of in our flavor, but uh, a boxer, uh, Gracie Jiu Jitsu, yeah. you know, and we'll, we'll just share, you know, and um, when JM Art passed away, because that was something he created, he was the president of that organization. I left that to the family mm -hmm. and for GM Daniel to figure out what they wanted to do with that. Mm -hmm. so in that spirit, though, I created the VA Martial Arts Collaborative. And so going back to your original question, what really inspired me is just the ability to 
share and cross train, but I also want to do something different. I want to give folks who are next to carry on that mantle an opportunity to just teach on the stage. So I could have a grandmaster teaching at one time, mm -hmm. then I could have someone who may be a brown belt or their instructor says, you know, this person's going to be the next person I want them to start teaching my art. Do you mind if I give them an opportunity to teach them how to teach? Oh, that's awesome. So yeah. I have cross shares where I do that. Cross shares are smaller, kind of the same. Anyway, I might have maybe two or four instructors. And those, we just come, there's no gi, there's no gi, no uniforms. We just come and we play. Everyone gets about an hour to teach. You show something, we all play another, we talk about it. Um, the bigger events, there's two parts to it. One of it is the physical activity here. Then mm. the next activity is at my house around some fire pits. I got like three or four fire pits. Food, I'm guessing food might be there. Or yeah, and that kind of I stole from the multi <laughs> style folks. You notice they're always eating after each thing. You know what I mean? They're yeah. grilling. Terry, man, he's like the master <laughs> griller. Jesus. Man. No kidding. Well, there's some that I take advantage. He's all, you know, this is only, you know, two something a pound right now. And I'll run out to the store and take advantage of the deal. But, um, guys, guys grilling. Yeah. And, but it brings a different aspect right? when you're training here with the instructors and then you actually go to the house. You get to actually have a conversation with the instructors. Yeah, you know, so much stimulus. Things are a little slow down. Yeah, you can slow down, and you get to hear parts of the art that you wouldn't hear with mm. the time allotment and the and the how quick the seminar is going. You know, once yeah. everyone gets some food in their stomach, they have some tri-tip or ribs, and they're drinking a beer. They're sitting around the fire. Then you get to really start, uh, you know, getting deep into the details. Like one time yeah. at one of those fire pits, GMR was talking about how. Daniel was teaching them how this body mechanic by fishing, they would go fishing and he would teach how to drop his weight. How interesting. Hmm. And I, I, the first time I had heard it after being, you know, a student of his for two decades was at a fire pit conversation at one of these after parties. Yeah. Something just a setting triggered it. And you yeah. Know what I mean? yeah, yeah, yeah. So, wow, that's, think, yeah. Huh. So that's the aspect. Like, unfortunately, I can't invite everyone that comes with seminar. That's usually just the instructors and the select few of their students. Yeah, yeah, which is which is that's that's kind of understood and known and accepted. Yeah. You know what I mean? You can't have everybody. <laughs> um, well, I mean, not if you want to stay married. Yeah, um, yeah, exactly. You know. <laughs> but uh, so back to this event, um, you just gave me an idea, something to try to do and. Connecticut. I, I think that's fascinating because um, my next question was, is it just FMA related? And obviously you answered yeah. that, um, which I think that's awesome because again, they get to see, so to speak, the kind of the other half, what they're doing and, you know, and vice versa. You know what I mean? Um, well, I FMA guy might get an appreciation for BJJ by seeing a demo and what have you, and maybe would perhaps want to cross train in that, see the value in it, you know? Yeah. Um, I think that's great. Wow. And uh, so biannually, wow. So what do you do? So like what, summer, winter? I do one in the spring. I do a spring one and then I do a fall event. Um, this last one I called it the winter event, but it wasn't, my wife told me, it's not winter. You're still in fall. Yeah. Right? So yeah you, guys, yeah, you guys don't know what winter is. But yeah, no. I'm in Connecticut, I'll show you winter. <laughs> so it's it's a, uh, it's more of a spring event and a, and a winter event is for the big gotcha. one. Uh, and then, Sprinkled in there, I may host an event for a different organization like the, the, um, let's see, who do we have here? Um, I'm, I'm drawing a blank. So a colleague conversations group, they might do something. Um, Akaju Kempo may, may do some Golden Dragon Ohana, you know, the host event here. And in, in some cases, mm. I just open up the venue and, you know, create a space for them. And unfortunately, I can't do it for everybody, but, you know, it's just an opportunity where I'm blessed to have this space. To just really promote the FMA, get the Looks word great. out, there. and Thanks. we've been doing it. Yeah, since 2011, we've been getting people. That, the amount of people that walk through this door, the amount of people who come and eat and, and chat around the fire pit. A lot of them who have passed away, you know, like Ted Satello or, you know, just some of the greats, you know. Um, yeah, legends are. Yeah, so legends, I mean, yeah. So two day event, I'm assuming. What's that? Two day event. Something? It's a one day event. It's an all day event. Oh, just one day. Okay. All right. One so, day. so it's yeah. It starts at we we bow and we or doors open at eight. We go from nine to like nine to four thirty. Afterwards, we go from like six to twelve at my place. You know, and so just a long day. Wow. Yeah. The, wow. And the next day we just beat. But how many on on average? Just average. Like how many instructors you got there on average? Eight total. I now eight total I've now secured and... to eight total instructors, and there's okay. two floors going at the same time. Two floors are going to sign eight instructors, yep. and these eight instructors are going to be from very disciplines. Yeah, we have an A group and a B group. 
And so whoever you're calling, everyone's going to get to touch hands with the person that talked to that day. So if you're in a group gotcha. during the first part of lunch, you're going to be in one floor. In the second part of lunch, you're going to go to the other floor and the instructors switch floors. So yeah, it, it just works out better that way. On average, again, like what do you, I mean, as far as people coming, uh, as far as the uh, attendees, like how many? Well, well, the pre-pandemic, we're looking, we're starting to get up to the 80s and 90s people, which That's is, a, wow. it's a good crowd. This time, last yeah. Little, yeah, we had, we had about 50, maybe. 50. Yeah, I know, but you got, you got to put that on the pandemic. That's nothing reflective of you. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? You know, and then unfortunately, you know, we had to raise the cost because I have it catered. So when we have the lunch here, participants get, you know, full authentic food, uh, Filipino food, uh, food costs go up. So my costs go up and then we have raffle prizes. So, you know, by the end of the day, yeah. you know, it's, it, but still, I think in for 70 bucks, all day training with eight different instructors. You know, oh, that's a, that's a bargain. Yeah. Oh my God. That's, that's, that's incredibly reasonable. There's yeah. guys that charge you one day a buck something to go see so-and-so for, yeah four hours, which I'm just like, yeah. And I, and I purposely, uh, you know, I'm a blue collar working guy that started out and I just, I try to keep it. If I can keep it when I started, I didn't even pay, you know, I made donations to GM art. And so mm. I kind of try for the most part, I try to keep it as reasonably as I can. And luckily the people that I bring here have the same mindset. You know, That's they nice. just want an opportunity mm. to share their art. And, um, at the end of the day, the instructors, you know, whatever, it all depends on how many people we get, cause they're going to get a, a cut you know, as long with the, the people here. So everyone, I try to make it as fair as possible where at least if nothing else, they got, you know, gas money or, or they could pay for the hotel stay at the end of the event or something, you know? Yeah. That's, I'm telling you 70 bucks, man. That's like, wow. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah and I, and I felt bad raising it from 50. It used to be 50 bucks. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It used yeah. to be 50 bucks, but then it just, it just got to the point where I was out of pocket, you know, yeah and you can't be doing that no. i mean you're doing a great thing i mean it's you know okay you break even everybody's happy that's one thing but when you're kind of shelling out that's a that's a tough thing to, <laughs> to chew on yeah um that's incredible like wow um yeah again i just see some of these prices some of these they're getting charged for one day and all that and here you are charging 70 and they're getting eight instructors i mean that's well yeah, man, oh, it would, I would love to have you out here sometime if you could. I mean, so somewhere, even if you wanted, you know, do an FMA discussion there and then you do one here or something and have. Oh, somewhere. my God, be, uh, uh, yeah. that, would be, that would be wonderful. Yeah, but absolutely. I'm like, I'm doing what you're doing. I think you're doing a, in a sense where at least we get to see the demo and talk to people. I try to bring people here together and, you know, yeah. and sometimes, you know, you sometimes I've got there's people who I don't invite back who just don't have that spirit. You know, they come in and they just. You know, they're the God's gift to all of humankind. That's how you find out, I guess. And then you just, yeah, like you said, somebody else's replaces him. Yeah, but luckily, <laughs> for the most, it's, that's, I mean, that's yeah. the amount of awesome people that we had here and who support each other and support one another. And even within our, you know, the kind of the unsaid is there's little political rivalries. My door's open to everyone. You know, my mm. rule is as long as they haven't wronged me and they're not an asshole. You know, I'm going to give you a venue to teach. And I just may not put two different rivalries together to teach, but I'll, I also, try, same to, yeah, and I also yeah. try to invite, I always try to re represent my Filipino Ohana from Stockton. So I'll always try to bring someone else from Stockton to be on the floor. Oh, yeah. No, it's not as well as you should. Yeah. Yeah. That's, yeah. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. You got to do that. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know. Well, that's all. I mean, that, again, I didn't know the magnitude of what you're doing, and I certainly didn't know you're doing it twice a year. I just think that, yeah. Um, your next one, it sounds like it's spring, correct? Yeah, we're trying to secure a date for either April or May. So, yeah. worst comes to worst, I'd be more than happy. To, we'll have to get you back on and cover it from the FMA point of view. Obviously, we can make you know the references to the other folks. I'm not, you know, I'm not. Yeah. That cut and dry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, wow, wow, wow. So, hey, you know, I got a couple of questions. You obviously seem pretty open, reasonable guy. Um, you know, what, what positive, you know, if you would like to see anything positive change in our community, you know, what would you like to see with respect to the FMA community? Um, 
You know what? It's hard for me because I've already seen the change I wanted to see, but it's unfortunately, it's, it's kind of myopic view. It's here in the Valley, you know, in California Valley, there's a lot of cross sharing and people, I think just sharing their ideas and having conversations and, you know, because when I started out, it definitely wasn't this way. You know, you could definitely, you go to a tournament and you could sense the, you know, the eyes and the tension, stare, right? and the tension and, you know, but luckily a, a thing I took away from my, my senior instructor, senior master George is he got along with everybody. Like he was, mm. you know, he's so easy going that, Hey, what's going on? You know, and what you have a part of your house, you know, and mm. you know, they, and so he was able to break those barriers and the whole time I'm thinking, Oh shit, is something going to go down here or what, you know, but yeah. so I think, but I think everyone is kind of a little more open. This next generation is open to sharing. And I, just I agree. I think you're going to see a change. I think once some of this old guard gets kind of one way or another, kind of out, I'm definitely seeing it. Um, yeah. More folks are open to cross train, have dialogue. Um, you're seeing more and more different instructors getting together via a physical or on Zoom. Um, yeah. Yeah. And even, yeah. even when we started out, we didn't share a lot. You know, people would come in and my instructor, he'd teach like a clock theory where he would, he would, we'd be doing the cuerdas and then he'd kind of flip the clock to a different timeline and we would jump into something else. Like we would yeah. just do basic, it's all, oh, let's practice the jab. You know, people walk in, they're like, is this FMA? And we just, we're just practicing our, our fun, you know, still learning good stuff, but he would not show certain stuff when, you know, cause he's afraid just a different mentality back then of, you know, yeah. Yeah. Well, now yeah, I, just, I, mean, I share everything. You see, I show you my notes. I'll throw everything on there. Like this is all. This yeah. Is all. Right. I mean, knowing that, I got, I guess, are there any secrets anymore? I mean, I don't know. You know, <laughs> no one in that more open for sure. Yeah. yeah. I don't think there's secrets anymore. There's, I mean, even for me, they're just, they're just stuff that I'd, I'd like to, that I'd really, really like, you know, and just because the way I was taught, sometimes I, you know, I just, mm. I got that mental block to share it sometimes, which I've started to break away from a lot now that I just, yeah. you know, because it's going to get lost, if, you know. No, you know, it's, I know, and that's something I bring up, you know, just, you know, look, it kind of coincides with bringing the youth in here so we don't have these systems dying out. Well, um, I think that's important. And the sharing, right? I mean, it's like, you know, you're keeping this here, and then before you know it, the system's gone. Yeah, yeah. Because nobody shared it. Yeah. <laughs> you, know I mean? yeah. you know, so I don't know if that benefits anybody, right? I mean, just, uh, yeah. You know, if there was another system, you know, if you had the time, you know, and you could dedicate time and you, you want to train, if there was another FMA system, you could devote time to, what would it be? Probably it would be probably Balintawak. Balintawak, okay. There's a lot, I think there's a lot of similarities between kind of what we do with the boxing and the, um, yeah, I can see that. yeah, it would probably be that, uh, that particular system. But then that's just from my own, of what I know. I, I don't know all the other systems out there, you know, yeah. um, but just like Bobby Tabawada, the way he teaches and the way he, you know, I just like, I, for some reason, I just gravitate towards that, you know? Yeah. I can understand that though. You're kind of, I mean, what you just mentioned that would fit, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So I, you know, that there's that, but I'm a martial arts nerd and I, I live and breathe it. Yeah. And someone, you know, just like the, the dojo at work, there's a dojo there. I mean, I'm in. Sign me up. I can't believe that. I never heard a work setting having a dojo. That's yeah. well, they have one. They have one there. They have one at Los Alamos Lab. Uh, yeah. So there's a couple places that you know when I was. I tell you, give it to the people who own it or the executives because that's incredible, man. That's foresight. Wow. Yeah. Well, for us, it's called the Livermore Livermore Networking Lisa Employee Services Association or something. So they recognize that. You know, we have the ham radio club. We have an archery club. We have a, I think it's a drone where you can fly drones. There's a game board club. There's, you know, so there's all these different things. There's a soccer club, which I also belong to, you know, they do pick up soccer during lunch. They, there's a volleyball club is, and they recognize that folks, you know, cause you spend long days there at the lab and, you know, and sometimes you need that break and, and they see the network. And if you can have a connection to the organization and company, for me, from the martial arts standpoint, like I'm one, I'm mm. one belt away from getting my black and Kaju, which went on hold because of the pandemic. But 
I mean, it's pretty hard to leave another company when you know I can do martial arts here and get ranked in the martial arts. The retention, I'm going to guess the retention there must be like zero. Yeah, well, the retention, <laughs> no, the retention went down with the pandemic when they closed that all down. We just got permission to reopen last week. Okay. So just think about yeah. that. The dojo finally reopened after last since two years. That's incredible, though. I mean, good on them. The exact. I mean, for having that. That, that yeah. that's the first time I'm ever hearing this. That that's incredible. Wow. Yeah. That's Jeez. Um. Pretty cool. Yeah. Before I let you go, uh, future goals for yourself, system, function, the event you're doing. What are your future future goals overall? My future goals, honestly, are continue to study. I'm lucky that GM Art left me a framework and a schematic. Like I'm going through some of my old notes now and I'm seeing things that I can continue to grow the art because he gave me, he gave me a schematic. And, you know, one thing he told me is like, here's a schematic. All you're going to now do is take pieces of these different schematics and start building upon it. You know, and, and I'm seeing it now with my students, you know, when I'm going through and I'm doing the baits and switches and I'm doing the sticky mm. hand stuff, you know, all that stuff opens up a new avenue of exploration. And so for me, I'm doing that a lot. I'm focusing on where I want to take okay. the boilers next. Um, I'm working on, you know, J Senior Master George and Daniel Sizon, you know, some and um, Alex Bushman, some of the original, some of some of the guys from the old school crew because we're trying to bring the group back together because, you know, it was a little mm -hmm. falling out. And so, I'm hoping to share more decorados, host some decorados events here, some camps like the stuff I showed here. I have actually decorados camps where I get to showcase things like that. And then for the VA collaborative, I want to do more cross shares where I bring in kind of the brown belts or the, you know, the, the next level of mm. teachers and give them an opportunity to teach where then I could, you know, I can coach them or they're instructing coach them. Okay. When you're working with an audience, you know, or you're teaching a big group, you know, focus, cause I want them to, cause how, where else can you get an opportunity to really teach, you know? And so the cross share has kind of set the stage for the bigger event. I call it the big dance, you know, and I like, yeah. I like to yeah. see someone teach. And once I, you know, if they're new and they say, I want to teach your event, I was like, oh, do a cross share first and let me see how you interact with the students and how you teach, mm. you know? Because at the end of the day, it's, if you're, we're providing a service, I think we provide a service to make the students and participants who come, you know, feel like their time was well spent, you know? What we, what we don't want is instructors who browbeat them and like, you know, you're doing this wrong. This, I want it to be very positive and, you know. Yeah, positive experience, yeah, sure. So there's that, uh, but really I'm focusing on my students uh, for me, I'm focusing on my kids, you know, and my son. I'm doing BJJ with him, and he's a teenager. Oh, that's awesome! Yeah. yeah. So, you know, I would go watch him. I'd watch him. Then, oh, Dad, when are you going to join him? When are you going to join him? So I jumped in with him, and so I've been doing that, you know. But I try to just go there and empty my cup and just just do what they teach me. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just keep mouth closed and just listen and and do. <laughs> yeah, and don't, and don't try to do anything I may have as a possible solution. Yeah, you know, and that's hard. You know, it's hard. Yeah, yeah. I mean, right. If you have like a background and you you see something, you want it. But yeah, it's hard to write to be just disciplined and just yeah, just doing that. Yeah, but it's kind of refreshing yeah. though for me. It's kind of refreshing yeah. to get be there and get humbled on certain things and and just like I, I think it's a nice reminder for all of us. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's right. I agree. I mean, it's. Uh, I think of time to time, you know, we all need it. You know, and. Yeah. Uh, I think it's healthy. <laughs> right, right. So, anyway, I want to thank you. I want to thank everyone who joined today. Oh, I appreciate it. Yeah, this was. Uh, I'm glad we, you know, I'm glad we finally made it happen. You know? Yeah. So, uh, Tony, come over and let's, let's say thank you. To yeah, you. yeah, definitely. I mean, he was. Yeah, you know, I want to give a round of applause to Tony. He always, he's always so there, he's, taking yeah. the beating for me, and. Yeah, appreciate very it. Very student, thank but. Uh, and thanks for the opportunity, Dean. And I hopefully we present oh, yeah, something yeah. here that people can take with them and. Maybe absolutely. Well, I mean, hey, I'm just excited. we got your we got it covered as a whole. So that that was perfect right there. You know? Yeah. All so, right. Cool. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, hey, you guys take care. I appreciate you. All right. Peace. Maybe we'll see you in Manteca one day. You always have a home here. Absolutely. That would be that would be it. I, I know I there's a list of people I gotta meet <laughs> since doing this show, man. It went from like it's in the hundreds now, you know. Awesome. <laughs> so, uh all right, you guys take care. All righty, take care. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. All right, that wraps up episode 249. And there's a double header. And actually, in exactly 30 minutes, episode 350, um, Pena will be interviewing Robert Small.
but just happened to work out that day. So if you've got nothing to do, check out that episode within 30 minutes. Who is up next after that? Uh, we got a couple of people. Um, Greg Bouchard, I'm going to try to get on. He's going to be doing pretty much just demos. See a lot, though. So I think that'd be kind of interesting. Who else? I'm just looking for the official list here, which I just found. Uh, we also got Luis Prado next weekend. Portugal Stick. That's going to be exciting. I think that'd be kind of neat. Um, yeah, so Greg Bouchard of the demos. Luis Prado, Portugal Stick. <laughs> And gonna try to squeeze in, um, folks. Beat the crap out of cancer. Uh, I attended a couple weeks ago. It was phenomenal. Uh, sparring opera is there, just eagle free. Just and uh, I really want to cover that. Um, I just think it's a worthy thing to cover, not just for the cause, but just the event in itself. So that's coming up. Also, Christmas raffle pinned in FMA discussion. Ten bucks a ticket. Got some great items in there. Uh, Mark Denny of Dog Butters donated his whole DVD thing. Brown Frank is sending me knives. Uh, I think he's sending them out next week. Um, Brian Rodriguez is donating a storage stand. Yeah, check it out. But uh, incredible stuff there. And again, all the money we get received, we donated, generally speaking, to children oriented uh, <clears throat> communities shelters uh food banks what have you uh, orphanages so yeah so check that out 10 bucks a ticket and you could win something all right all right folks but again uh yeah 25 minutes or so uh guru tom episode 350 with uh robert small and i'll see you guys later